Warning, this episode would make Elmo faint. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com and by the new board game for the family under quarantine, Housetrap. Housetrap, how dangerous is chloroform? And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is friend of the show and member of the Deep State, calling you from deep within the U.S. mission here in Islamabad, Pakistan, where they do blast the call to prayer at us five times a day. And I can tell you that every time they blow up a wedding in Swat Valley, it only goes to prove that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's April 23rd. And it's Talk Like Shakespeare Day. Huh. Hello there. Oh, I'm Francis Bacon. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I'm no illusion. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Carly Lloyd's, New Jersey, oh, it's good Cincinnati one. Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. Oh, this week's episode, Heath and I handle the headlines wild and free. Religious leaders wonder if our Surgeon General is even a real theologian. <laughs> and Andrew <laughs> Torres will be here, because Eli and Heath are doing the headlines without me. So. <laughs> but first, yeah. the diatribe. A lot of people have been asking, they say, hey, Noah, you've been working from home for a long time. How do you keep motivated? How do you not play Xbox all day instead? And, and I get it. it. It's a weird transition to make. Now, to be clear, I have an unfair advantage. My job is to yell about all the dumb shit going on in the world. And that's what I'd be doing, even if I didn't have to work. But I have some practical advice that really helped me a ton when I was first getting used to the home office thing. And that's dress for work. You know, it'll, it'll seem weird at first, but yeah, get up in the morning, go through the same routine you'd go through if you were actually going to go to work, make yourself presentable and all that shit, put on a suit or a uniform or a pair of slab shoes and a pork pie hat, whatever it is that makes you think I'm at work and wear that while you're working. And then when you're done working for the day, change out of that shit, right? Or like, you know, whatever, take off your tie or take off your bra, whatever it is that signals to you, okay, I'm done working for the day. And believe it or not, that makes a huge fucking difference. Suddenly, you kind of feel like you actually went to work and then came home. You know, we used the same trick back in my neo-pagan days as well. It was a big deal that everybody made their own ceremonial robe. It's the only thing I've ever sewed in my life. It was a big deal that, A, you always wore that same article of clothing whenever you did ritual magic, and B, that you never wore it at any other time. And that made it easier to be solemn about this shit. It's pretty hard to take yourself seriously when you're like invoking the undines of the West, but it's significantly easier when you're wearing the right clothes. But more importantly, the robe made it easier for other people to take me seriously, too. You know, I know that's hard to believe in the abstract. It doesn't seem like dressing up in an ill-fitted, wrinkly, amateurly stitched 200 thread count moo moo would make me more authoritative. But it turns out that the specifics of the clothes don't much matter. Let's face it. You'd need a big red nose or something to make an outfit sillier than the getup they put London cops in. And you still take them more or less seriously. It's the power of the uniform. It's what that uniform means to us culturally. Dark colored robes means satanic magic wielding shit. Suit and tie means doing important stuff. Checkered edging and custodian helmets makes us think this person can tell me where to park, I guess. And of course, church has been using that same trick since forever, haven't they? You show up in a shitty room full of scratched up benches that smell like old people and you sit there for an eternity while some old guy yells random shit about Jesus. If it wasn't for the fact that everybody was wearing fancy clothes, it would be indistinguishable from going to a Greyhound station. But since everybody's wearing their Sunday best, it's suddenly a solemn occasion. You know, and this doesn't just work for the parishioners. Obviously, the church leaders take advantage of it as well. You don't see as much of it around here. It's something that most of the Baptist churches have moved away from, but they still occasionally toss on that smock of holiness or whatever. But Catholics, whoo, 
Like, always look like some sad effort by Elizabethan chess pieces to dress sexy. I mean, sure, the, you know, the collar's pretty subtle, but these cardinals and bishops and whatnot, they, they walk around like the whole point of the outfit is to dare me to say something. Imagine if there wasn't a whole church with all these centuries of tradition and shit, and there was just like... One guy who dressed like a cardinal, everything from the El Muse to the Zucchetto, right? That motherfucker would put flaming bagpipe unicycling Darth Vader dude to shame. I mean, the Pope literally carries around a magical staff a la Gandalf and world leaders take him seriously. But that's no coincidence, Right, It's not like it just so happens that in this time and place that shit looks goofy to us. It always did. It's a common thread amongst regal imperial clothing. The crowns of the kings, the robes of the popes, the garments of high office. They have to be flamboyant. They have to stand out. They have to be something that nobody would choose to wear for fashion purposes or they don't work. Right, These folks aren't trying to be trendsetters. They're trying to stand apart from you and above you. And sometimes part of that is wearing clothes that almost dare you to laugh at them. Of course, kind of fucks things up when you just laugh at them, though. You know, that, that, that's why they always whine about how we should respect their religion. It kind of requires that mindset for all this shit to work. If cops didn't wield any authority, we wouldn't have much respect for that uniform. We'd just be like, wow, that looks uncomfortably hot on a day like today. You know, right? like their uniform represents the power of the state, and that's a real thing. But the authority behind the liturgical garments is hollow. And so when I see the pope or one of his cardinals or bishops or whatever, I don't see the garments of high office that I'm supposed to see. I see a guy dressed up like a pedophile that doesn't care if you notice him. Right. I see somebody dressed up like a professional liar. I see an antiquated person representing an antiquated institution founded on antiquated notions drawn from antiquated morals dressed appropriately in antiquated apparel. Because the imperious display of finery and feathers doesn't mean a goddamn thing once you realize that the clothes have no emperor. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the Oscar to my Felix, Eli Bosnick. Eli, you ready to couple oddly? If you mean spray disinfectant into the faces of my loved ones, Heath, way ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> I've no doubt that you're doing way too much of that. Okay. In our lead story tonight, the highest ranking doctor in the United States gave a Christian sermon this week on national television. Yep. That's the timeline we live in now. Surgeon General Jerome Adams gave a speech about the pandemic and in his capacity as our chief expert on medical science, he told the country exact words, God always has a plan. Well, you know, based on how our government's been doing, it's nice to know that somebody has a plan. Just you know, anybody. <laughs> All right, well, we have three possibilities here. Let's take them one at a time. Scenario A, God exists and has a plan, in which case we're in a phase of that plan that involves a rampant global plague, the closing of church services, tens of thousands of Christian people dying, especially the ones who ignored the church closing safety orders, and the destruction of the world economy, leading to the suffering and death of predominantly the poor people that Jesus was always talking about helping. That's the scenario our Surgeon General believes in. I mean, to be fair, he didn't say it was a good plan, Heath. He just said it was a plan. Okay, I'm not willing to, to be fair. All right. Anyway. Fair. Here's scenario B. <laughs> God exists, but he clearly didn't finish his homework, and now he's just yes-anding himself and making <laughs> shit up. And... He clearly took an improv class taught by Michael Scott. So he just burst in the door and started killing people. He did. That's very possible. No, it's not. But if you're convinced there's a God, you need to admit he's super bad at being a deity and it's stupid to worship him. And I don't know, maybe broaden your horizons a little bit <laughs> author wise. Try some uh, Margaret Atwood, maybe. There you go. There's one. Honestly, I'd be afraid of giving them ideas, Heath. Not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Scratch that. Maybe some Kurt Vonnegut. No? No. Nope. Okay. 
How about well, man, if you you won't read it, you'll miss Clifford it. the Big Red Dog. It's <laughs> tongue in cheek. Okay, that's maybe comprehensible to the, the people we're talking about. Try Clifford. <laughs> anyway, that brings us to scenario C, also known as reality. There's a fucking pandemic, and the science people in charge of dealing with it need to be immediately fired if they're working on a plan inside counterfactual scenarios like A and B. Yeah. But thanks to religion, the majority of the world thinks we're in some version of A or B. And they're arguing with each other about which wrong thing is more wrong. And they're not even aware of it. They're not even aware of the irony. And the rest of us, aware that we're living in the scenario called reality, have to listen to these idiots spend time arguing during a pandemic Mm -hmm. with both outcomes of that argument being super fucking stupid. (laughs) For example, the Surgeon General got some pushback right away. Okay. From, from, okay, but it's not what you think. No. It, the example I'm going to give you here, the pushback came from Celia Dean Drummond with a hyphen, already gross, a senior research fellow from Oxford. Oh. But, but okay, but again, it's not what it sounds like. She's doing research in a theology laboratory. <laughs> She released a statement because she had important input that needed an official statement to be released. She said, quote, to assume that a specific natural event is a deliberate plan of God is far too simplistic. True. True. (laughs) Again, let her finish. (laughs) Continuing. It's an irresponsible opinion. Also true. Aired without taking (laughs) due account of either the science or. The theology, quite apart, this is my fuck, I hate this part the the most, quite apart from the intersection between them, (laughs) end quote, the intersection between science and theology. I love how this lady's translation is just like, you idiot, don't you know when things like this come up, it calls for fancy talk, damn it, (laughs) fancy talk. (laughs) You're out of your element, Donnie. (laughs) That's her entire job, is fancy talk in situations like this, yep. And just for the record, in that same speech that Jerome Adams gave, he agreed that science and theology don't conflict. Weird. And he's not talking about uh, the the non-overlapping magisteria thing, which is also stupid. But he, he, that's not what he's saying. He's literally become an overlapping magistrate. Yes. So that's not what he's saying. Yes. And now we get to watch the Surgeon General of the United States and an Oxford theologian argue about the location of an intersection at the corner of fucking Nowhere Street and Unicorn Boulevard. That's what's happening. Yes. And dumber still, we get to watch a useless tool get corrected by a definitionally useless tool about (laughs) not being vague enough. Right? That's her note. Not vague enough. Yes. You're making us look dumb. You got to do this way more vague. (laughs) And just for the record, the response we're getting from the government is not Oh, cool. Well, uh, you're fired because that's not what the Surgeon General does. No. Instead, we're getting a backlash from religious leaders <laughs> saying that Jerome Adams isn't qualified to make statements about theology. <laughs> we live in fucking bizarre world. Am I crazy? Am I the one who's crazy? Oh, what is happening? They're the ones who stay in your lane. And we're like, yeah, stay in your lane. But like yeah. this one, I don't know. Maybe their lane. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and in I Cast the Spell on You news tonight, pastor, head of Louisiana's Life Tabernacle Church and earless Ross Perot impersonator Tony Spell <laughs> has been in the headlines an awful lot the last couple of weeks over his refusal to close his church despite the pandemic because, quote, true Christians do not mind dying, end quote. All right. Well, at least they're proving it. That's nice. <laughs> but they don't mind us dying either. So, I mean, and also known as murdering yeah. is what I just described. That's, <laughs> that, what, that's murder. what I called. So regular listeners to the show will remember he then assembled a legal dream team. <laughs> if your dream is hitting on high school girls at the mall, because he hired Roy Moore. <laughs> well, this week, true to his word, spells other lawyer, Jeff Wittenbrink, was hospitalized with COVID-19 and one of his 78 year old parishioners died from it. Now, if you're hoping I'm going to tell you next about how Spell has been arrested for 
reckless endangerment or reckless endangerment, right? You know, fucking murder. Murder, sure. Uh, you must be new here. Welcome to the pod. Oh. I'm kind of the Shirley Temple. Um, the, the child actress? Uh, no, the drink. Embarrassing and full of too much sugar. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that tracks. So yeah, Spell, for his part, denied that his parishioner died of COVID-19 and instead took to YouTube to announce his hashtag Pastor Spell's Stimulus Challenge. Oh, this is catchy. It's a good <laughs> hashtag. In which he asked people to give him their stimulus check. Yeah, great. Uh, side note, by the way, according to Andrew, our hashtag dump a bucket of COVID phlegm on Tony spell challenge, it's canceled now. <laughs> Whatever. You should not do that. That's our official statement on that. Yeah, he got all so Don't do that. Yeah, don't. So here's the quote. Quote, hashtag pastor spell stimulus challenge. Three rules. Rule one. April the 19th, 2020, it begins. Okay. Ruled, not it's really a rule. It's not really a rule. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a date. Unsurprised that Tony Spell doesn't know what rules mean. He's All right, rule two, donate your stimulus money. Okay, gross. Rule three, donate it to evangelists. Grosser. North American evangelists who haven't had an offering in a month. Missionaries who haven't had an offering in a month. Music ministers who haven't had an offering in a month. I'm donating my entire sim stimulus, $1,200. My wife is donating her stimulus, $1,200. My son is donating his stimulus, $600. Great. Hey, question. Why is it North American evangelists? Why, how it's is a that? race. It feels like a race thing. It felt racial. Yeah. I feel like he wrote to... Realize that someone might give that money to someone who would help and then just try to narrow it down until it was just him. He's not OK with it going to like an Italian evangelist at this point. What? No, definitely not. He wow. concludes hashtag pastor spell stimulus challenge. If you don't have a church, give through my website. I'm here on the Mississippi River. I'm here okay. at Red Stick Baton Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Pastor Spell Stimulus Challenge. He, he, tra <laughs> he translates Baton Rouge for us. <laughs> wow. By the way, this just occurred to me, and I'm pretty sure this is legal. You can tag whatever pictures or videos you want with Hashtag Pastor Spell Stimulus <laughs> Challenge. If you are allowed to... To put those pictures on the internet, you're allowed yeah, if those to tag are them with any hashtag legal you want. pictures. If they of started legal. Consenting adults, maybe two yes. beautiful <laughs> men who are especially hairy. M maybe eight beautiful men. Yeah. Hashtag Pastor Spell Stimulus Challenge. All right. Got it. So if you're wondering <laughs> how killing a guy, making a guy sick, breaking the law, and then asking those people for their stimulus money is affecting Spell's church attendance, the answer is not enough. He no. it's not enough. So according to the advocate, quote, Sunday service at Life Tabernacle Church attracted about 130 people down from nearly 500 who attended last week's Easter services. According to the police, who've been counting the heads of people entering the church for services and forwarding their reports to the district attorney's office, end quote. Oh, cool. Cool, 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 cool. So uh, police, while you guys are... Are over there counting heads. A uh, small thing. Maybe arrest the zombie horde while yeah. you're there. Yeah. You're up, <laughs> if you don't mind. It, it's it's weird to just count the plaguing zombie horde. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not, a weird really, thing. not really. Not really. Isolation. Ha! Ah, <laughs> next up in headlines: a large slab of beef shoulder in a suit delivered a speech to the American Association of Christian Counselors last week, explaining that the State Department is officially. The diplomatic arm of God. Or Mike Pompeo is still Secretary of State and he did that. It's hard to tell. <laughs> but one of those two things happened. And I'd say it's super problematic either way. Not for us vegans, it isn't. You angered the sentient zombie beef sides. You deal with them, Ethan, <laughs> right? You deal with them. <laughs> we'll, we'll eat them. We didn't anger. I don't it, we'll, we'll talk about it later. So... It's 2020, as we all know, and that means the darkest timeline. So I'm going to assume it was Pompeo and not the better scenario where it was the side of beef. The Secretary of State had a meeting hosted by a Christian hate group, literally a Christian hate group, and told that hate group the U.S. State Department has uh, 
a bunch of extra time right now. You know, nothing big going on. So they're happy to help with, again, the hate grouping. <laughs> and then he violated the First Amendment about 45 times. It yep. was it was like he was playing a theocratic lightning round on a game show. That includes proudly announcing that religion informs everything I do, declaring that he's been chosen by God to, I guess, finally get some Christianity into America, and pointing out that during his oath to the Constitution, he had his fingers crossed behind his back for Jesus. Yeah, he did. Exact words. I've been unabashed in my role as Secretary of State to talk about the fact that I swore an oath to the Constitution, but that my first calling is to my Savior. And that's something I tell world leaders, whether I'm with President Sisi in Egypt or whomever. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, Mr. <laughs> Sissy or whatever your name is. Before we talk about this, uh, I don't know, disarmament treaty, I just want you to know a 2000 year old carpenter I've only read about is first in my heart. All right, let's talk <laughs> missiles. That's what he's doing. He's our highest ranking diplomat. He's going to the president of Egypt during diplomacy and being like, so uh, I'll start by saying Jesus. It's nuts. And believe it or not, I still haven't mentioned the worst part. Pompeo has now officially fired up the Commission on Unalienable Rights. I can't believe that this is real. This is real. This is real. And it's it's a hate crime. The Commission on Unalienable Rights is new speak for a theocratic think tank within the U.S. State Department. He has a team of government employees right now brainstorming a list of God-given rights. So far, they came up with the right of gay people don't count. Yep. And that's what they have so far. <laughs> They're going to report back at the end of May with their finished work. Again, that they accomplished during April and May <laughs> of 2020. Well, you know, it's not like they had anything else going on. And hey, no, not a big deal. fingers crossed, maybe they're all in-person meetings. We could get lucky here. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely don't know how to use Zoom. And in patting ourselves on the back news tonight, according to a recent post from Professor Ryan P. Burge of Eastern Illinois University, Ooh, atheists are by far the most politically active religious group. All right. And statistically, that means you. So good job all. Excellent. And I recently heard about a pretty good opportunity to be politically active coming up in November. Ooh, you don't say. Turns out, listen up, there's a loophole in the Constitution that lets us put a term limit on horrible bigot theocrats. Check it out. November. Mm, does it require stamps? It, uh, it, I don't, honestly, oh. it might not. You know, I think we learned that a bunch of states, it doesn't even require a stamp. It's too D late. Up. I'm already out. I'm already out. You said mm, you. you didn't say no. All right. So, so Burge used the Cooperative <laughs> Congressional Election Survey and their 2018 data. And according to mm -hmm. that, self-identifying atheists were more likely to have attended a march, protest or political meeting, contacted a public official, donated money to slash work for a candidate or put up a political sign, regardless of education and income. OK, well, that's great to hear. But in a different sense, it's also kind of disappointing considering we're watching the continued erosion of secular government despite everything Eli just mentioned. And here's the bottom line. All those examples of political action are ultimately aimed at achieving a goal that's based on voting at its core. But that is a stat we're still lagging on. People who attend church regularly are statistically more likely to vote. And we need to flip that trend. That's big true. time. Yes, we do. And as we've said on this show countless times, you've got to be active and stay active if you want to fight theocracy. And hey, if you haven't done one of those things yet and you're listening to this, now is an excellent time to start. A lot of people have free time on their hands. Call your representative. Do it. Donate to a candidate you like if you got some spare money. And when you do, remind them that you are an atheist who votes. Yes. And then vote. Yep. You got to do that vote thing too. at the end of that. <laughs> and vote correctly, to be clear. And speaking of how difficult it is to vote, let's toss things over to our first sponsor this week, Stamps.com. Ah, I miss longboarding. I miss hiking. I miss the post office. 
You, what? Seriously? You miss the post office? Yeah, you know, Craig always trying to sell me on those forever stamps and the way Sarah helps me check when I forget which was our P.O. box. Well, why don't you use stamps.com? What's stamps.com? Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer. Whether you're a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Once your mail's ready, you just hand it to your mail carrier or drop it in the mailbox. It's that simple. Wow, that does sound easy. It's true. We used Stamps.com to send our Patreon rewards and merch to live shows. And it was so easy to do. And right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in scathing. That's Stamps.com. Enter scathing. Yeah, but I still miss Craig. Is, uh, is Craig the guy who had to mace you? We had a misunderstanding. Okay. Yeah. And we're back. I do miss Craig. <laughs> Next up in headlines, we have a new story about one million moms. Anna? What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. Okay, that's fair. That's practically their theme song at this point. I get it. <laughs> yeah. They're... Christian freak out the organization. <laughs> so for anyone who's new, One Million Moms is a Christian hate group of three white ladies who can't count very well. And uh, I'm guessing their names aren't Karen, Karen, and Karen. Odds are against that, but they're all fucking Karen. Yeah, they're, they're all fucking Karen. Karen. Yep. And they spend most of their time scouring the country for anti-Christian persecution, speaking to the manager at every restaurant they go to, and then very much eating small amounts of snot at those restaurants that they go to. <laughs> but mostly the persecution hunting. And they found a big one this week. Apparently, DuckTales aired an episode that included a kid with two dads. <gasps> so the Karens are fucking panicking. Okay, here's what I don't get. Why are they freaking out about gay Disney characters now? Like, Karens, did you see Scar? <laughs> right. He was just missing a boa, ladies. Like, he just... <laughs> yeah, so, so, before we get into the details of the episode, quick spoiler, it is not a children's cartoon show that shows us two male ducks having gay sex. Boo. Which, honestly, I was... Yeah, I was disappointed about that. <laughs> I'm very curious about all the logistics of, you know, the corkscrew penis, especially, uh, regardless of everyone's gender. I want to know how that works. And Eli, I know you have strong, strong feelings about this. I do. do you have any words of wisdom? Hey, folks. Obviously, Heath and Eli handled headlines on their own this week. However, at this point, they had a 45-minute conversation about duck sex, which turned into a really intense argument about duck sex during which both of them cried at least one of them threw up you can guess which one uh, anyway i'm just gonna bring you back in where where that left off okay agree to disagree on that last thing just fine. agree to disagree on the last thing fine thank we can move on thank you we have to so, <laughs> so <laughs> here's here's the plot of the show that made the karens freak out First of all, in case anyone's not familiar with DuckTales, it's about a millionaire named Scrooge McDuck and his nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, who live in Duckburg. And life is basically like a hurricane there in Duckburg. You got race cars, lasers, aeroplanes. It's a duck blur. And every episode, they get into a new adventure. <laughs> they, they might solve a mystery or even rewrite history. That's DuckTales. Ooh, ooh. I like how for people who don't know the DuckTales theme, you're just having a stroke right now or just pitching DuckTales super hard. It could, it could be all of those. You know, I liked that atheist <laughs> podcast, but I, I thought that part in the middle where the tall feller pitched <laughs> DuckTales for 25 straight seconds. That was a weird, weird twist on the format. <laughs> I love that song. So in this particular episode, Huey, Dewey and Louie, have a friend named Violet. And Violet 
has two dads and they both wear a shirt that says I'm with dad and has an arrow pointing to the other one. And this is my favorite part. The two dads also adopted a different daughter right in Christianity's face. Yeah, they did. The, the writers clearly put that in just to trigger bigots. And it all the way worked. Sure did. The Karens are fucking <laughs> having a meltdown. Yeah, they are. I mean, for example, not only do I now know that a new DuckTales exists, but I want to watch it. So, you know, <laughs> across the spectrum. It's, it's pretty great. So in response to the implication of the existence of a same sex couple of to be clear cartoon animated ducks cartoon ducks yep one million moms released the following statement <laughs> quote with the theologian they have the same yeah, statement uh, service. Uh, yeah, the, who the who are the what's this pr firm that's just releasing nonsense anyway we gotta start releasing the, statements heath it's pretty yeah, obvious <laughs> we need a statements guy you got a statements guy right i'll get a statements guy cool here's the quote the official statement from One Million Moms. It's apparent to us that this particular producer is not finished with indoctrinating children by exposing them to homosexual relationships through a facade of normalcy. End quote. And just to be clear, the facade of normalcy <laughs> that the, the Karens are talking about is normal <laughs> animated gay ducks. Yeah. That's what they mean. So great work by DuckTales is the point of the whole thing. Yes, definitely. One of my favorite shows when I was a kid and now even more reboot. Great, great stuff. Check out the original and that reboot if you get a chance. I like, mean, reverse boycott on this. I love look, it. I get it. I get it. But I don't know, Heath. Sure. This is OK. But where does this putting in acceptance stuff end? But Scrooge, you can't be trans. We're married. <laughs> okay, I'm pretty sure that's just transparent. Yep. DuckTales transparent. DuckTales transparent. Okay, got it. And <laughs> finally, in Karanamaniacs news tonight. Uh, stolen pun. Yeah, but pun. it's a good pun to steal. It is. Christian okay. book publisher Zondervan has a new book coming out this month that's sure to explode onto the charts. <laughs> called The Quran with Christian Commentary, A Guide to Understanding <sighs> the Scripture of Islam. Great, great. Christianity <laughs> is finally going to read a second book, and they landed on literally the worst possible pick. Yep. Like, I get what Ray Bradbury was saying, blah, 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 don't burn books, but I'd Fahrenheit 451 the fuck out of those two books. If we're making a list, <laughs> those are the two. They're in That's the what we're burning. Top two spots for sure. Yeah. So Zondervan, whose other publications include The Case for Christ, The Purpose Driven Life, and Eric Metaxas's disappointingly named Seven Men, describes their <laughs> upcoming release by saying, quote, be equipped to interact more fruitfully and thoughtfully with Muslims. Really? Just like, hello, Muslim person. I know our interactions haven't been very fruitful, so I uh, I have some margin notes for your Quran. Is this helpful? <laughs> are, are, we, are we being fruitful now? Are you loving this? So here's how they <laughs> the describe fuck? the book. The Quran with Christian Commentary offers a unique introduction to the primary religious text of Islam. Alongside a precise modern English translation of the Quran, author Gordon D. Nickel provides in-text notes to explain the meaning of various surahs, chapters, and ayat, verses, their interpretive history and significance in Muslim thought, and similarities and differences when compared to biblical passages. The description concludes... Professors and students in courses on Islam and the Quran will find this to be an invaluable resource, as will pastors and missionaries who minister among Muslims. Written at a readable level, <laughs> any Christian who wants to learn more about Islam and the Quran will find it to be a rich and informative introduction, end quote. All right. Well, combining religion with more religion feels like a terrible fucking idea. Yep. And that means we're going to put 30 seconds back on the clock. Haven't done this in a while. Titles for the new Christian Islamic religious book genre. Go. Uh, the not so good book. <laughs> the, <laughs> the divine tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about Ramadan Quixote? Love it. Uh, how about the libel? 
<laughs> uh, the Haji's progress. Ooh, halal Pilgrim. quiet on the Western Front. <laughs> <laughs> the man in the Iron Mosque. <laughs> <laughs> Son of man in the Iron Mosque. <laughs> okay, uh, the Sunni also rises. <laughs> Excellent. We got some Hemingway there. Yeah. Uh, how about the Chronicles of Narnia? <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And by the way, that last one is definitely the title for the Christian slash Muslim musical spectacular that we are going to be making. Yes. Get Excited. I feel like hats off to Botswana. Kind of, we kind of stalled. Oh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You, well, Maybe you know, we divert our attention. Broadway's dark. So, yeah, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough phrasing. And we're going to wrap it up right there. Eli, thanks as always. See, this is why I do that part. Fair, 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 fair. Jumanji. And when we come back, <laughs> Noah will be on the show again because we have control of the time dimension. Hi, I'm Heath Enright. And I'm Eli Bosnick, inviting you to join us this Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern for our Stay the Fuck Home live stream on YouTube with special guests, the How-To Heretic. We'll be playing games, answering questions, and generally hanging out with the audio uncles you didn't know you loved. Plus, my mom will always be roasting me in the comments. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, she will. <laughs> it's the best. The Scathing Atheist Stay the Fuck Home live stream, 8 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. Because if you're stuck inside, you might as well be stuck with us. One of the tools employed in America's slapdash, uncoordinated, yakety sack scored response to the coronavirus pandemic is the stay at home order, some form of which has been enacted by a number of states that is distressingly lower than 50. But... As we've increasingly learned over the last few days, these can be ineffective if redneck conspiracy theorists, sovereign citizens say nah-uh. So to examine some of the legal repercussions, we're pleased to welcome back the host of the Opening Arguments podcast and friend of the show, Andrew Torres. Andrew, welcome back, sir. Hi, Noah. Thanks for having me on. Uh, quick, quick trivia question. Do you want to know what uh, every state that lacks a stay-at-home order has in common? I bet you'll never oh, guess. <laughs> let's see. Um my entire lack of interest in ever touristing there. Yeah. Well, that too. Uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's among the three people who are three people who have never been in my basement. Yeah. Answer. Uh, but I was going for governors with R's after their names. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just once again, disproving the both parties are the same argument that I hear so much of. Hear less of that. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and by the way, thank you for the cheers reference that all our over 44 <laughs> listeners will get. It's just, we, we like to hit every demographic in order on the show, and it's good. It's, we're late in the show now. All right, so first things first. According to the Constitution, I have the right to peaceably assemble. I, so, so like, are these, are these stay-at-home orders unconstitutional? No. And look, this is super clear, right? So states can't completely disregard your constitutional rights, and we've known that since the aftermath of the Civil War, right? States do have broad police powers, though, to restrict your rights as necessary for health and safety. And the case that uh, you may even see in kind of mainstream press is a 1905 Supreme Court decision. It's called Jacobson versus Massachusetts. It dealt with a smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts. And the Supreme Court said, yes, the state had the power to force compulsory vaccinations during a smallpox outbreak. And this was 1905. Right. So, well, yeah, you know, not, you know, the states could only do about three things back then. But you know, <laughs> one of them was force you to get vaccinated so that everybody didn't die of smallpox. Oh, my. I can only imagine what these people would be doing if it came to the point of compulsory vaccinations. Jesus. It, I mean, as long as we're, we're doing that rabbit trail, the 1905 smallpox vaccine was infecting you with cowpox. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it had a death rate of about 10 percent. Right. Oh, so, Jesus. yeah. I, I mean, it was a, a truly a triage moment. Wow. Yeah. And these people can't even handle, you know, fucking super cuts being closed for a month. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, wear, this could get a, wear a bandana around your mouth before going to the mall. Um, right. Freedoms. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So I, I have to add this one because it's 
one of the sovereign citizens' favorites. What about that judicially recognized fundamental right to freedom of movement that I have? Oh, God. And I'm glad you asked that for, for two reasons. Uh, a, because I got to hear that delightful accent. And B, uh, because this one actually takes a little bit of time to unpack, right? Like that, this is one of the things that sovereign citizens d- do well within their particular brand of crazy. And that is the, they'll find words that you and I think mean one thing, but lawyers know, well, not you and I, I guess, I guess everybody else thinks means one thing, but lawyers know means something different, right? So let me, let me give you an example before I explain how the right to freedom of movement is one of those things, right? The right to privacy. If I say, usually to my mom when I'm 13, I have a right to privacy. That means I want to close my bedroom door and knock before you come in, right? Right. It means don't go looking at my stuff or asking me what I'm doing when the door is closed, right? The Constitution protects a right to privacy, but it's a very, very different thing, right? It, it is the right to make personal decisions like whom to marry, whether to have kids, whether to use contraception, right? And I, I wouldn't have used that word, but it's what lawyers used. It's the basis for Roe v. Wade, Griswold v. Connecticut, all of those really important decisions. So, you know, it, it's it's an example of where we, we have a clearly established right that doesn't mean the colloquial definition of the word. And that's what right to travel means. And to, and to understand and, and unpack it, right, you, you have to put yourself back in the mindset of the founding fathers at the time of the drafting of the Constitution, right? That we're thinking about 18th century continental Europe, where you might have taxes that prevent you from leaving Belgium or entering France or whatever. So all the right to travel means is that if you live in Maryland, they can't tax you if you want to move to Pennsylvania. Right. It does not mean you get to drive drunk and slur at the cops who <laughs> might be detained when they pull you over. Right. Like it, it, it just means you can't be forced to stay in one of the states. And again, not, you know, they can't stop you from flying out of an airport. Like, you know, look, there's nothing to stop you right now in any of the stay at home states from, you know, walking across the border into another state. Well, except common sense. I mean, the nearest state to me is Florida. So, yeah. Um, I don't <laughs> out know, of the across that. Well, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Right. Getting DeSantis, out of Georgia, so. <laughs> who the hell even knows at this point, oh, right? God. Yeah. All right. So it's, this is the, the legal equivalent of, like, the, the biological equivalent of that would be, you know, the colloquial versus scientific definition of the word theory yep. that they love to throw around to dismiss evolution. Yeah, gotcha. that's, a, that's the perfect analogy I wish I'd thought of it. I'm going to steal it next time. <laughs> hey, no problem. No problem. <laughs> All right. So now, obviously, these stay at home orders, they have exceptions for essential business. Is, is that a legally defined thing or is, is it up to each state to define essential business for themselves? You know, it's it's actually both. Right. So your governor can define that however she wants. But there is federal guidance. There is a sub department of the Department of Homeland Security called CISA, the Cyber Infrastructure Security Administration, which I have to tell you, I had not heard of until a month ago. And they've released a critical infrastructure guideline that a lot of states rely on. I'll, I'll give that to you. You can link that in the show notes if you want. Oh, sure. We'll do. I just I have to wipe a tear from my eye because when you referred to my governor as a female, I thought about how different it would be if we had Abrams. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Better too. world. Better <laughs> world. All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to promote you to the governor of this podcast. What would be your quick and dirty heuristic? for what would count as an essential business. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see. So uh, liquor stores for me and Heath, uh, Mm -hmm. dispensaries for you. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know. Vegan grocery stores for Eli. (laughs) But actually, like the the serious answer, right? It was kind of a giveaway in in the answer to the last question you asked, right? Which was the Cyber Infrastructure Security Administration, Right. right? There's a reason that agency developed the list, right? Businesses that could work online, could work remotely, should. That that strikes me as a super great heuristic. It's not one that states are following, but uh, but that would be yeah. yeah. Well, OK, well, and that brings me to my next question. Like, as we've discussed on this show, some governors have added exemptions for churches as essential businesses, which strike me as places that can work online. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so let's turn back to the Constitution. Is there a legitimate concern that these governors have about religious freedom 
or are these exemptions just pandering? Okay, this is an answer I I would have answered this differently uh, three years ago, pre mm-hmm. pre Trump, like right as in the uh, uh, halcyon days of just just starting opening arguments, where the answer of what the law is. And what will actually happen was usually the same thing. And the answer should be no. There would be no concern about not identifying a church as an essential business. But over the weekend, a Trump appointee, John W. Brooms, who graduated from the nation's 107th rated law school, uh, <laughs> lost his goddamn mind. So, uh, yeah, who knows now? Yeah, yeah. OK, so that kind of. Leads us to the reason why I frantically emailed you over the weekend and said, oh, God, Andrew, please tell me you can come on the show uh, on Thursday. Let's turn our weary eyes to Kansas, where over the week said federal judge blocked the governor's order that limited church attendance to 10 people or fewer. What the hell happened there? Yeah, let's let's kind of start at 30,000 feet and then and then go into the order, because on a macro level, what happened? is the unintended but completely foreseeable consequences of the fact that the Roberts Court's jurisprudence on religious liberty issues makes absolutely no sense. And this is something I've talked about on your show, on opening arguments, to strangers on the bus, shouting from (laughs) rooftops, ever since the court's decision in Trinity Lutheran back in 2017, where I came on your show and ranted for like an hour and a half, right? Like, uh, here's what happened, okay? Okay. Before 2017, we basically had three to five decades of a workable First Amendment jurisprudence in this country. Okay, it wasn't perfect, but we knew what things meant, right? So the First Amendment has two prongs that apply to religion, right? There is the Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion. That's the Establishment Clause, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the Free Exercise Clause. And so here's how it broke down. For free exercise, so long as you had a neutral law, even if it incidentally burdened your religion practice, uh, tough shit, right? That's Employment Division versus Smith, right? And for Establishment Clause, it was a little more complicated, but we had a case called Lemon versus Kurtzman dating all the way back to 1971, right? So half a century of pretty solid jurisprudence that said, okay, what the court has to do, what what government really has to do is stay neutral on religious matters, right? It can't intend to either promote or inhibit. It can't have the primary effect of either promoting or inhibiting, and it can't excessively entangle itself with religious stuff. You know, stay out. Again, there was some criticism. There are scholarly law review articles that criticized both the Smith and the Lemon decisions, but we knew what the law was. And the problem was that the pro-religious contingent on the Supreme Court didn't want neutrality. Right. They wanted the government to aid religion, and they also wanted to pretend like they care about the First Amendment. So they started coming up with these outcome-driven opinions, like Trinity Lutheran, that literally do not cite any cases in terms of creating brand new rules about what counts in cases that involve churches, right? And even though like all the commentators were talking about how narrow Trinity Lutheran, like I came out and I said, look, the dangerous thing here is that it says you are entitled to an, a neutral and unbiased evaluation of your religious beliefs. And no one, not even us lawyers, knows what the hell that means. And that was the same problem in Masterpiece Cake Shop in, you know, again, in which the like the facts don't care about your feelings crowd all of a sudden meant, oh, well, I mean, not not my feelings. Right. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So here's the heart. Right. You had the Supreme Court essentially get rid of the lemon test. They have essentially without said it got gotten rid of Employment Division versus Smith. That's coming probably in the next term. They're going to specifically overrule that. And what we're left with is and it's just kind of whatever you want. And shocker, a lot of judges, especially judges in Kansas, want Christianity. Yeah. 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 Especially Trump appointed judges in in Kansas. Don't worry. They're all 27. You know, they'll be gone soon. (laughs) Our great, great grandkids are going to accelerate the revolution, I promise. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, but now this judge, I, I, I haven't read a whole hell of a lot about this because I knew you were going to come on and, and, and have done my homework for me. But this judge 
said that the order that the that the Kansas order, the stay at home order showed hostility towards churches. Yeah. So <laughs> did Kansas Governor Laura Kelly add a P.S. Jesus can go fuck himself into stigmata at the end of this thing or what? <laughs> OK, this is actually what what makes me angriest about this opinion. Because it is, uh, to use a legal term, 100% bullshit. And you can read this for yourself in the procedural history, which is included in this judge's opinion. Wow. But let me explain this out because this is the exact opposite of hostility towards churches. But hostility was the buzzword that was used in Masterpiece Cake Shop that no one knows what it means. So that's what they had to cram this into in order to strike it down. Gotcha. So here's what happened. Like a lot of states, Kansas has been issuing executive orders successively, right, as the problem gets worse. So the first EO was promulgated over a month ago, March 17th, and it prohibited mass gatherings of 50 or more people and also shut down both public and private schools in Kansas. That, that's how they started. Yeah. Then a week later, they defined mass gatherings instead of being 50 people as 10 people. And then three days after that, March 27th, Kansas issued its stay-at-home ruling. That was EO 20-16. And in evaluating this hostility claim, I want you to understand EO 20-16, the stay-at-home ruling, exempted churches, left them out, said you could still go to church because, you know, even though the governor is a Democrat, it's Kansas, right? Right. But you know what? You you give a church an inch and they'll bus in 29 loads of people to drink out of the same glass, lick each other and <laughs> scream demons out. Right. They will. Yeah, I've seen them do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so 11 days after that first EO, that that EO 2016 was promulgated way later than it should have been. Governor Kelly promulgated EO 20 18, right, which added churches and other religious buildings to the list of places where you can't gather more than 10 people at a time because duh, right? And then it said this, and I'm going to read this directly again from page three of this judge's order. Okay, so this is what EO 20-18 said. With regard to churches or other religious services or activities, this order prohibits gatherings of more than 10 congregants or parishioners in the same building or confined or enclosed space. However, the number of individuals, such as preachers, lay readers, choir, or musical performers, or liturgists, conducting or performing a religious service may exceed 10, so long as those individuals follow appropriate safety protocols, including maintaining a six-foot distance between individuals and following other directives regarding social distancing, hygiene, and other efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19. That is what this judge found hostile to religion. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, no, the, my, my simple question was, wh wh what? That's it? <laughs> yeah. That there's no, there's no but at the end of that? No, it is a provision that is objectively less hostile than it is to secular businesses, right? It is complete madness. And what this judge did was sort of seized on the fact that the executive orders went from excluding, right, like had to talk about churches specifically, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, you could have just said as an executive order, you are prohibited from gathering in groups of 10 or more at any public place and such public places include, but are not limited to, and then listed right. all of your, you know, theaters, amphitheaters, public theaters, closets, churches, what, you know, stuck it in a list of like 90 different things. But this judge still would have said, ah, yeah, but you put churches on the list. Yeah, right. So that's a form of hostility. It's madness. The Tenth Circuit, which is which is where this is is going to be appealed, will almost certainly overturn this judge's order. It is it is nonsense. But yeah, it, it's a victory for Jesus as of right now. Wow. All right. So you, you kind of already hinted at this at the answer to this question. But just to be uh, clear on this, it, if a federal judge negates this order, does that affect similar orders in other states? Yeah. And so there are a couple of things to, to think about here. It's a double-edged sword, right? Which is, on the one hand, because things are moving quickly, a lot of the power is going to be 
in the hands of individual federal district court judges, right? And you never know when you're going to get a Trump appointee like John W. Brooms, who apparently doesn't care about what the law is. But the good thing about that, right? So that's a bad thing if you happen to live in Kansas. The good thing is that one federal district court judge's decision does not bind any other federal district court outside of that district. Right. So other states, other courts are free to tr- to treat an order as persuasive. Mm-hmm. Right. Which means they can say, you know, the court considered this issue in, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they're also free to say that's not persuasive. All right. So it, 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 at the risk of closing this on a positive note, um, <laughs> infrequent as they have been, there actually are a couple of cases where religious leaders who have defied orders are being held to account yep. by state and local governments. So most notably, you've got Roy Moore's client, Tony Spell, and the man with the science fiction anti-germ laser guns, <laughs> Rodney Howard Brown. Now, I don't expect you to comment on those cases in particular, but like in general, can pastors who hold services in defiance of these orders be punished? They can, but... In case we were in any danger of ending this segment on a positive note, let me tell you as a practical (laughs) matter, they will not be, right? Yeah. The purpose of promulgating the orders and publicly arresting the pastors who defy those orders is to try and protect human beings, right? Is to try and actually break up these gatherings and hopefully deter future conduct. We'll see if that works, but I can assure you, right? Like courts are not processing cases right now. When they do, I promise you that these will be dropped. None of these pastors are going to have to worry about paying fines or, you know, let alone serving time in jail. But hopefully it will it will get somebody to behave in a somewhat rational manner. Well, one thing's for sure, regardless of the outcome, they will act like fucking martyrs about it. I guarantee you that much. (laughs) And you wouldn't believe the month in which I had to broadcast these sermons on the Internet like a common podcaster. Yeah, right. (laughs) Uh. All right. So if you're thinking to yourself, by the way, wow, Andrew sure did clarify those legal issues and made complex matters entertaining and easy to digest. I would encourage you to check him out on the opening arguments podcast where he does that all the time. Andrew, thank you so much for stopping by Uh, with a with a setup like that. Anytime now. Before we toss this episode on the counter and ring the bell, I wanted to let you know that my guest appearance streak is going to continue once more. Look for me on an upcoming episode of The Thinking Atheist with Seth Andrews. Had an awesome time like hanging out with him, trying to sort out what the fuck is wrong with the world. So keep an eye on our Facebook page and at PIA Teapot on Twitter. We'll send out links as soon as they're available. Anyway, that's all the blessed movie we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Off Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this would be at least a W short of a show if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for atlasing the fuck out of the headlines this week. I want to thank Eli Bosnick for eventually agreeing that just because it would be funny if his audio was too quiet for anybody to hear this week doesn't mean that we should do that. I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Lusions, who definitely still exists and has not been kidnapped by aliens or anything. I promise Twim is coming back soon, probably next week. Lucinda's fine. Thanks for asking. And also, I want to thank Andrew Torres one more time for helping arm us all against the upcoming argument with Aunt Kathy. Definitely check out the Opening Arguments podcast if you're not already a subscriber. Great show. Also, I want to thank our contact in the Deep State for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And hey, don't get me wrong. I I am glad to know somebody's out there thwarting Trump, but uh, behoove you to thwart a little harder. eh? Like just a little bit. little. Anyway, yeah, I'm in Georgia. You know, life depends on it anyway. But thanks for what you're doing, though. Seriously, seriously. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people. Colton Scott, Trent Other, Scott, Eric, Robert, Lisa, CTK, Too Much Musing, New Age, Turmoil, Sword and Bull, Greg, Karsten, Evan, Franklin, Frank, and Yorch. Colton Scott, Trent Other, Scott, Eric, and Robert, whose dicks are so big you kind of have to call them Richards. Lisa, CTK, Too Much Musing, New Age, Turmoil, Sword and Bull, who raised the intellectual bar so much that those tiny little coops are now called moderately intelligent cars. And Gary, Karsten, Evan, Franklin, Frank, and George, whose sexual prowess has Jesus soliciting second coming lessons from him. Together, these 18 AO Kathiists ate at our aims to alienate Abrahamic a-holes this week by giving us money. Not everybody is fortunate enough to be in that expendable income situation 
donation, but if you are and you'd like to give money to us, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres, Tim Robinson hands on social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. A Mickey Mouse here? Yeah. Is he like, but Scrooge, like that guy? Yeah, you know, Mickey. Ho ho. Yeah, you know, Mickey. Okay, man. Yeah. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.